Hey, to all the real estate professionals out there, I want to let you know the Buyer's Mind is sponsored by Homebridge Financial. Homebridge loan officers are experts in new home financing, and they bring sales ideas and strategies and market intelligence and programs that will help sell homes. To learn more about that, go to builder.homebridge.com. Homebridge Financial, home financing made easy. It's time to make a sales phone call. Are you excited? You should be. Let's talk about it today on The Buyer's Mind. Welcome to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a closer look deep inside your customer's decision-making mechanism to reverse engineer the perfect sales presentation. Now, please welcome your host, Jeff Shore. Well, welcome everyone once again to another edition of The Buyer's Mind. I am your host, Jeff Shore. This is the podcast where we try to understand how our customers think. If we know how people want to buy, then we can make it easy to sell to them. That's our goal. And today we're going to be talking about an oldie but a goodie, the phone call. It's kind of funny when we think about making phone calls. It's something that used to be the hallmark of sales. That's what salespeople did. And we got all these different ways to be able to communicate with their audience. And the phone call sort of went by the wayside. And we're going to show you today that what is old is new again. Joined, as always, by our show producer, uh, Paul Murphy. Uh, Murph, what do you think? Uh, uh, phones? No phones. Are you, do you enjoy phone calls? Do you not like phone calls? What, what's your thought on phone calls? I actually like phone calls, but uh, if you ask my kids, they're all about texting. And so I, it's very frustrating <laughs> when you're trying to communicate with people because it's like voice to voice lets you share so much more. And if you're going to be snarky, yeah, you can be snarky. Yeah, right. Well, you and I you know, sort of grew up in a generation where that's all we had was the telephone and we haven't known anything different. So, you know, we're natives uh, to that. I can't understand uh, why some people might prefer uh, other than a telephone. Uh, but to, to you and I, it's just not that big a deal. You make a phone call. It's it's what we've been doing since as far back as we can remember, right? Well, as long as you had a quarter or a dime in your pocket, uh, the payphone always, <laughs> always worked. Or that, that one phone that was mounted on the wall in the kitchen with a really long cord that would reach to all the rooms. You know? If you didn't strangle everybody with it. <laughs> if you didn't strangle everybody, yeah. But at any given time, yeah, it was always a trip hazard as somebody was trying to walk around with that corded phone. If you're 30 or under listening to this podcast, you may want to Google corded phone and see what a picture looks like. It'll blow your mind. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it is interesting how we, you know, we grew up with a telephone. The telephone was so normal. And uh, now it's, it's almost like in some cases for salespeople, it's this, oh no, the telephone. And it's really interesting because uh, when we look at the opportunity to uh, to talk to people, and we'll get into this with with Art here in a little bit, but there's this idea of what does the communication hierarchy look like? And, you know, face-to-face -face is always best, but if you can't do that, well, what comes next? And and I would say that anything has live communication in it is going to be pretty darn important. So uh, let, let's hear what Art's uh, subject has to say about this. Art wrote the book Smart Calling. He wrote it actually several years ago. It's now in its third edition, and it's just been re-released. It's a, a fantastic book. And as you listen to Art, just you can put yourself in one of two camps. One that says, you know what, I'm perfectly good with the phone, but I want to get better. Good, Art can help. But you might be looking and saying, oh, man, I'm just not a telephone person. It might be that you're missing out on such a huge opportunity that it would be worth your time to listen because you might find some ways to get dramatically better in really easy ways. Let's listen to what Art Subject has to say about smart calling. Well, today we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects. Uh, we're going to talk about telephone calls and how we make telephone calls. And some of you are like, oh, no, not telephone calls. If that was your immediate reaction, you need this. I'm going to tell you flat out, uh, years ago, I took an assessment for sales professionals, and and it marked me with an above-average telephobia score. So it doesn't mean that the telephone and I are the best friend. Now, fortunately, my achievement drive scores are much, much higher than my telephobia score, so I was able to work through it, figure it out. There's no question about it. The telephone used to be the staple of sales, and then everybody said, yeah, but emailing is so much easier. Well, the question is, are you into easy? Or are you into effective? That's the question. And that's why I wanted to have Art on the show. Over the past 30 years, Art's subject has helped uh, salespeople say the right things to get through, get in, to sell primarily using the phone. He's a speaker, he's a trainer, he's an author, podcaster, lifelong salesperson. 
Bart received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Association of Inside Sales Professionals. He's got five books. His flagship book, Smart Calling, How to Eliminate the Fear, Failure, and Rejection from Cold Calling, just released in its new third edition. I'm holding a copy right now as we speak. It's the standard for individuals and companies worldwide to prospect effectively without what we would traditionally think of as cold calling. I'm really excited about this conversation because it's a conversation that needs to be had. Art, welcome to The Buyer's Mind. Jeff, thank you so much for having me on. I so admire your work and uh, it's an honor to be on your show. Let, let, let me t- take you back to the early days here. Um, y- you and I have been doing this long enough that we our, our sales careers predate the internet. So there was a time when you were face to face or you were on the phone And that was about it. So is this something where you had just sort of figured out how to master the phone because that's all you had the chance to do, whereas we have a lot of people who have come into the sales business in the last 15 years who who saw the phone as something of an evil in their life and they associated it with intrusion marketing and therefore didn't want anything to do with it. Well, yeah, I guess going way back, my, my very first job was when I was 13 and I was selling tickets to the policeman's fundraiser circus. And then I realized I was actually pretty good at that. And I could sit indoors and just talk on the phone and make money. So it seemed like I gravitated to phone sales type of jobs all throughout high school and college. And then my first corporate job was with AT&T back in the old Bell system days. And, and then I decided to make a business out of it. And uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, back then we we had to use the phone and it was not something where people would go, oh, I'm not going to use the phone. I'm going to send an email or tweet or, you know, do some kind of social selling, whatever that is. So so we had to do it. And and yeah, I think within even just the last five years, people have started to look more for the easy button. And and I think Part of it is a result of our culture, too, where if you I mean, not to indict an entire generation, but if you look at a lot of the younger generation, many of them don't use the phone to talk on. They'll use it to, to send messages on in a variety of different platforms. You, you know, it's interesting. Um, the phone used to be the only way, as you just mentioned, there are any number of ways, although I agree with you with the idea that uh, some th- things that we call sales may not really be sales. Uh, social selling, I think, falls under that category. But where do you see the phone fitting in amongst all of the other communication tools out there? Well, I'm glad you said communication tools because mm-hmm. let's let's look at this thing called sales. I mean, sales is messaging, right? Today we have a variety of different ways to message. So it, it's funny because sometimes will people will accuse me of, well, you're you're saying that the phone is the only way to sell. Well, no, of course not. The phone is a method of communication. Sales is sales. I do believe that is one of the most effective ways to sell, aside from face to face, and then the hybrid using video, audio, and um, of course, you the screen selling. But I think that the, the goal for any, any salesperson should be to have a live communication, whether that be face-to-face or whether it be over the phone or, or through video. And uh, all these other forms of communication I use myself, and I, and I strongly believe that people should be proficient in them. But again, it is most effective when people are doing what we're doing right now. That's having a two way live communication. Yeah. It's almost like there's a hierarchy of communication. Ultimately, uh, just as human beings, we're going to communicate most effectively if we're standing in the same room face to face. Often, oftentimes, as a sales professional, you have no say in that. But if that's not going to be the case, then some form of live communication is always going to be better than uh, the the default of well, it's easy, so I'll send an email. You know, I know you talk about this in the book, but let's just let's talk about the elephant in the room for a lot of salespeople when they think about selling and the phone. When they think about selling and the phone. The phrase that comes to mind is cold calling. Can you give us your position on cold calling? I mean, a lot of people say there's no room for cold calling whatsoever anymore. Some people say, are you crazy? You have to cold call. Tell us about cold calling. Well, I agree with the people that say cold calling is dead. The cold should be dead, but not the calling. 
there's absolutely no reason for somebody today to make a cold call. And I define a cold call as calling somebody you don't know, who doesn't know you, who wasn't expecting your call. And then we're giving everybody the same pitch without knowing anything about them. And in many of those cases, our message might not even be on target because, again, we're saying the same thing to everyone. Mm -hmm. So what I suggest is is making a smart call and a smart call by definition is simply doing our research so that we know something about the, the person, the organization, if we're calling business to business, and also anything going on in their world that might make them possibly a better prospect for whatever our solution is. And uh, I, I know with the name of your podcast here and, and your work, what, what we're trying to do is look at why do people buy? And mm -hmm. the, this fits into that perfectly because we don't know why people buy until we speak with them, right? But we, we can have an, a, a hypothesis, that's a big word for me, of why somebody might buy and uh, therefore I can target my audience and then I can do some research to try to find something, uh, maybe a trigger event or uh, some commonality, something that's going on in their world where I can make a connection so I and put that in my initial messaging so I don't sound like the typical salesperson who's placing mm -hmm. that cold call. Um, right. So we most definitely should be prospecting, but it should not be a, a cold outreach. So that, that true cold call, like here's a list of phone numbers of people you know nothing about, uh, uh, that, that's, that's not smart calling, that's dumb calling. Uh, so it, but, but it doesn't have to be, or it's not that difficult to figure out something about the person that, that you want to call. Uh, let, let's get into the book. Let's, uh, let's, we're, we're, we're talking here to Art Subject. He's the author of uh, Smart Calling. This has uh, now been re-released in its third edition here. You have an entire section of the book on the topic of pre-call planning. Uh, can you talk a little about how salespeople have gotten that wrong in the past and how important the planning process is when it comes to your phone calls? Well, I, I guess the most egregious error with, with pre-call planning is not doing it all mm -hmm. and uh, practicing the, the smile and dial, numbers game, throw it up against the wall, uh, see what sticks. For every no you get, you're that much closer to a yes, just pure BS. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I never bought into that. I mean, think about that, Jeff. Uh, for, for every no you get, you're that much closer to a yes. Really? Mm -hmm. I mean, if I took a two-headed coin and I flipped it 100 times, am I any closer to a tail on the 101st flip? Mm -hmm. Of course not. Right. Right. Because I'm not doing the right things to get the result that I'm looking for. So pre-call planning, actually, well, I, I've always said the success of a call is really determined before you pick up the phone. I mean, it's kind of like an athlete. Uh, the, the success of what you're going to do when you're on the field has been determined in all the work you did prior to stepping on that field. Same thing with golf. And we're in a performance sport. So if somebody just gets on the phone and just starts winging it, they're going to go down in flames. So there's a lot of things I suggest people do, both on a macro level, which is, I mean, really trying to understand my target market. What do they want? What do they want to avoid? And I know you're big on this, and this is one of the first things I do in training programs, is that we, we really define this, not, not why we think people should be buying, what's going on in their world. And, and again, it's going to differ by different types of people, particularly if, and, and, and again, I know we have a lot of business consumer sales people here, but for those of you selling business to business, you might have multiple buyers in at multiple levels of an organization, all with their own agenda. So therefore we have to really identify the, the personas of those people and what are their, what are their motivators possibly? And, and again, it's still possibly because we're not going to know until we, we actually speak with them. So that's part of the pre-call planning. Then the pre-call planning on a micro level is doing our research on the individual and or the company also that we're calling if we're calling business to business. And, uh, and we do that in a variety of different ways. And, and like you said, it's so easy for us today with just a couple of keystrokes or mouse clicks to, to get tons of information. Uh, and it doesn't have to take that much time. Sometimes people will object to, oh, well, I, I can't take time to do research because I have to be making calls. Well, you're always going to place a better call if you know something about the people that you call. So I can personalize, tailor, and customize my message so I don't sound like a salesperson. 
You know, I, I, I love the, the concept here that it's really not that difficult if you know what you're doing, which is why a huge recommendation on the book here to help you put that plan together. It's not that difficult. It doesn't take that long to stand out. But Art, I know you. You own a business. I own a business. How often are we approached by people who know nothing about our business? Even when it comes to this podcast, the number of emails that I get with somebody reaching out and saying, oh, I've got this guest. He's going to be great for your podcast. He started this company that helps uh, engineers figure out how to bridge technical gap solutions. I'm like, you've never heard of this podcast. You don't know who this podcast is. You don't know who my audience is. If you did, you wouldn't have written what you just wrote. And so there's just this idea of understanding who you're trying to call to in the first place sounds right out of the gate. Like you're going to stand apart from the crowd, right? Is it that simple? You and I probably get the same messages from the same people. And I had that conversation yesterday with the guy who, and, and, and it kills me how disingenuous they are because they start out with, I admire the work that you do and I love your podcast and you're so passionate, blah, 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 blah. And then I have the perfect person for you. And then he went on to describe this person had nothing to do with sales. It was how he had, he works with people doing finance Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I normally don't reply to these people the first time because I want to see if they're doing any follow-up. You, you, you may know something about that, right? <laughs> and uh, so, so he did follow up and, and he used this tired old phrase. I just want to bump this to the top of your inbox about yeah. the perfect guest for your show. And then I replied to him and I said, well, if you actually listened to my show, you would know that this guy doesn't have anything to do with what my audience listens to. So, right. yeah, I mean, it, it's not that difficult. Now, yeah. on the other hand, uh, you probably know Jason Bay. Jason took the right approach and he actually did listen to the show and he pulled out a couple episodes that he quoted from. And then and he gave me a couple ideas for what he would want to talk about on a show. And he said, do you think any of these would make sense for your audience? And I thought that was the perfect way to do smart outreach. Yep, completely. Well, it teaches you a lot about the person that you're talking to is if if they're diligent in their research and their service to you at up front, uh, um, the, the trust begins here right out of the gate. You, you talk about both the mindset of the call and also how you open a call. It seems to me that well, let me look at it this way. You know, if I'm if I'm watching a sales presentation or a recording of a sales presentation, Uh, I can tell you after about maybe 90 seconds how the entire remainder of that presentation is going to go just by how it opens up and and what's been accomplished in that first minute or two. Uh, It seems to me that the majority of phone calls that are made in the sales arena are probably made or lost in the first few seconds. You didn't I don't know if you I don't remember seeing that in the book, but do you agree with that premise? I've been teaching that for over 30 years. Mm-hmm. You you either make or break the call in the first 15 seconds, because really yeah. you, you only are creating one of two emotions at the beginning of a call. You're creating interest or you're starting to create resistance because we're, we're forming that decision in our mind in the first few seconds. It's either, okay, there might be something here, interest and or curiosity, or the other one is, uh, sounds like a sales call. I'm going to start getting rid of this person. Mm-hmm. And most calls, I would say over 50%, turn people into that resistant type of person who's going to try to get rid of the salesperson. So that's why I put so much emphasis on, A, avoiding mistakes at the beginning of a call. And a mistake would be anything that possibly could cause somebody to get into that resistant frame of mind. And uh, once we know the mistakes to avoid, of course, we can we can maximize our chance for success. Then there's certain things that we should be doing in order to get that person to lean in and be curious. And that's really all we're trying to do. I, I suggest that when, when you put together your opening statement and really your voicemail should be the same as an opening statement, it accomplishes two objectives. Number one, put them in that positive receptive state of mind. Because again, if you call and if it's a prospecting call and they don't immediately recognize your voice or your name or company name on caller ID, they're at best probably in a neutral 
or starting to be in a negative frame of mind. So we got to reverse that as quickly as possible, put them in a positive receptive state of mind. And then the only other reaction that we want is to get them talking from that positive frame of mind. We don't want to ask for a decision. We don't want to say, I want to get 15 minutes on your calendar because that's a decision. You hit somebody with a decision in the first 10 or 15 seconds, our, again, our natural reaction to that is, whoa, wait a minute, too early for a major decision. The biggest decision I want somebody to make at the beginning of a call is that they're going to stay on the phone with me for another 30 to 60 seconds, and I'm mm -hmm. going to keep earning more time. Let's let's uh, get into that a little bit deeper, because if we're going to think about how we start this call strong and how we make sure that that we've got somebody who, well, as you said, they're going to you're going to develop either interest or resistance. If we want them to develop that interest, can you talk a little bit about emotional energy and how critical not just the words on your script might be, but where is your head and, and what are you trying to not just experience what are you trying to feel as a salesperson as you get into this call well I, I talk a lot about mindset in in my programs because i firmly believe in our profession probably 90 95 percent of what we accomplish is due to what we think and how we feel when we're doing it. I mean, an accountant can probably come in, you know, feeling like dirt, maybe half hung over and put out a passable spreadsheet. That's gonna be a lot tougher for us, right? Uh, and, and I know I've tried, by the way. So <laughs> what we need to do is, is, is make sure that number one, just overall, we are totally sold on the value that we provide. And I always ask salespeople, I say, who here, believes you should be charging more for what you sell. And if all the hands don't go up, I say, we've got a problem here. Because if you don't believe that, how in the world are you going to be able to convey that to the person at the other end of the phone? And now, we don't want to confuse that with being phony, no pun intended. Hi, Jeff, art subject here with business by phone. Hey, how's it going today? Right? right. We've all gotten those calls before. No, we, we want to be, we want to be upbeat. We want to be enthusiastic, but we still want to be speaking to someone like we would be speaking to a friend, maybe with a little bit higher degree of professionalism. You don't want to, you know, bro somebody. It's like, yeah, hey, man, how's it going? And, mm -hmm. and I've heard some of that as well, yeah. and you probably have too. But I mean, we're, we're, we're talking to professionals here and it needs to be conversational. And, and I could get off on a tangent here talking about scripts. And I firmly believe that your opening should be totally prepared because if we have the opportunity to prepare it, why in the world wouldn't we? Because if mm -hmm. we just jump on the phone and we say the first thing that comes to mind, what are we turning in? A rough draft, right? And the, the second or third version of something is always gonna be better than a, than a rough draft. But the key, like with any script, is that it needs to be delivered the way an actor would deliver a script. So that it just sounds natural and conversational. Again, like we're, we're talking to a friend face to face, not like we're, we're reading from something. Well, and it's, look, I have just a, a little bit of theater arts background, but it's a, it's a great analogy because yes, I had to memorize the lines, but it wasn't simply about reciting the lines. It, it was about uh, uh, getting that that deeper message through the line. And if we if we know what it is that we want to say first, then we, even if we're not word for word off of a script, so I don't sound like a robot, but I practice it enough and I've, I'm strategic enough, my script becomes my strategy and that, and that gives me the entry into this. You have a whole chapter in the book on how to sound smart and how to sound smart. Love the premise. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, let's face it, people are form we're forming impressions of people all the time. And over the phone, we, we don't have any visual. So within a second, like you said, you can tell how a call is going to go just by listening to the first 90 seconds. I would say it's probably even less than that. And somebody at the other end of the phone is already forming impressions of us within the first second or two, just based on the way that, that we sound. I, it just kills me how many times like 
when we're buying something, you call up an organization and the person answering the phone is probably the last person who should be representing that company just based on the way that they sound. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like, doesn't the, doesn't the owner do any mystery shopping and, and, and call their own business to see how they're being represented there? So, uh, and, and the great thing, Jeff, about the, the way we sound is that it's a lot easier to change the way we sound than it is the way we look. So there's no, <laughs> there's no dieting or surgery or exercise involved. But what we do need to do is to record ourselves, which is easier than ever today because everybody's carrying a recorder in their pocket or in their hand right now. And uh, we, we should record ourselves all the time, listen to ourselves, figure out, do you like what you hear? And if you don't, okay, fix it. So it could be your tone of voice, it could be your delivery, it could be the use of, um, uh, uh, you know you know what I'm talking about, filler mm -hmm. sounds. And those are amplified when there's audio only. And this, the, our voice and our words are our tools when, when we're on the phone. And I've yet to see a, a great person who is awesome at inside sales or, or prospecting using the phone who didn't pay a lot of attention to the way they sound and didn't record themselves all the time. Uh, we're, we're just about out of time. Uh, before we wrap it up, we're going to put you on the hot seat, some rapid fire questions and, and rapid fire answers. You ready? Oh boy. Okay. These are not scripted. <laughs> Your very first job was what? My very first job was actually as a paper boy. Um, my, my first probably real job that I actually went to was, as I, I mentioned, I was 13 years old and I went downtown to uh, Omaha, Nebraska to sell tickets to the policeman's fundraiser circus, which I think was a scam in retrospect. Love it. Love it. And if you're under 30 listening to the podcast, you'll want to Google paper boy. All right. Uh, an album <laughs> or artist that you listen to in your youth over and over again. Oh, Aerosmith. Oh, sure. I love it. Uh, the most beautiful place you've ever stood. Had to be the village of Ez in France. Sure. Southern France. It's gorgeous. Absolutely. Uh, any book that made a profound impact on your life? How to Win Friends and Influence People. I mm -hmm. read when I was in high school. Can't argue there. A movie you've seen multiple times. Doesn't matter. You've, you've got to watch it when it comes back on. Bull Durham. You love it. And finally, your first celebrity crush. Celebrity crush. Oh my gosh, I'm not sure about that one. You really put me on the spot here. Uh, well, probably like most guys my age who are in, I just turned 60, uh, Farrah Fawcett. Yep, sure. That that famous poster. Absolutely. Love it, love it, who love it. I didn't have that poster. Actually, I still have it, I think. Um, no, I don't. <laughs> the book is called Smart Calling. The author is Art Subject. You absolutely want this book. And how do they find you, Art, on, on the interweb? The the book itself has its own page, smart-calling.com, smart-calling.com, because after you order it there through your vendor of choice, you can come back and get uh, a free resource, uh, online resource full of more training. And if you just want to reach me personally, go to smart calling, no dash, smartcalling.com. That's a blog, tons of other resources there. Plus, you there's contact information if you'd like to get in touch with me. I love it. I love it. Art, thanks for being on The Buyer's Mind. It was a pleasure having you. Jeff, thank you so much. All right. There you go, Murph. Uh, uh, just a really, really great call. It's just why I'm kind of curious is the non-sales uh, opinions here, Murph, about how that all sat with you as uh, Art was talking about making the phone call, how to make the phone call, why to make the phone call. How did that all sit with you? You know, it, it, here's the deal. Um, you know, when I get a phone call uh, like I did last night uh, from somebody who was wanting to survey me about some kind of political thing, um, you know, it was mm -hmm. a cold call. And uh, my, yeah. my immediate gut reaction was, you're, you're wasting my time because they weren't connecting with me mm -hmm. on a personal level at all. Which is, I think, what happens with so much cold calling. It's not personal. It's just dial, 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 and hope that I have somebody will engage, but there's nothing that, that serves us. And, and, uh, that, that's why I thought it was interesting. You know, we talk a lot in sales about cold calling and it, boy, I'll tell you when I first started in sales, I had a veteran who came to me and he handed me a reverse directory. So he said, here's this way you can look at it by streets. So here's a street where people make a lot of money. Uh, and now you can look at it and you can just call people up on that street and uh, and 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 you know that you're you're dealing with more qualified people. That was research. 
back then, uh, as strange as it was, because today we wouldn't uh, look at it that way at all. Uh, so that idea of cold calling, uh, well, I think uh, you heard what Art said, uh, cold calling is co- sort of a dumb call uh, when you look at it. Um, I also love that the idea of pre-call planning, um, of having that, um, it, as he called it, the most egregious error, not doing any planning at all. And Murph, I know that this is really important for us. We put this podcast out. If we don't have some sort of plan for the podcast, probably not going to be a very good podcast. No, and it takes a little bit of research uh, on your half and my half to uh, kind of figure out, okay, how do we want to talk to our guests? Who are they? What are they right. about? And, and you, you're a great interviewer because you do that great research to uh, intelligently ask them uh, the questions that people want to know. Well, I appreciate that, but really it's just a matter of respect. And I think that that I would put that over on salespeople. The research that you have to do to get to know somebody, that's a matter of respect, respecting the person enough to do some homework and figure out who this person is. Uh, It's not that difficult to understand, first of all, what is the target market of your buyer, and then to do research on individuals. That's not difficult. I also loved Art's comments about uh, creating emotions right out of the gate, either interest or resistance. This is a good test, I think, for you, the listener, to ask yourself the question, what am I creating right out of the gate? Am I creating interest or am I creating resistance in my customer's mind? And so your mindset going in is going to be so critical to be totally sold on the value that you provide, to make sure that you are mentally 100% in tune before you get started, and to have to, to be able to say, I'm going to bring value in this call. That should always be our goal, to bring value in this call. If we're not bringing value then why are you calling? It, it does not make any sense uh, to, to make that call unless you can make it valuable for the person. And that's the problem, I think, that we've seen with telephone sales over and over again. We don't bring enough value to that person that we're talking to, and so then what happens? It just makes us annoying. Uh, I, listen, I think that this is really worth you, the listener, taking a, a really good look at and asking yourself, how am I doing in this area of the phone? How, am I willing to try? Am I willing to lean into my discomfort? Am I willing to record my conversations, at least my side of the conversations, so that I can listen for those verbal ticks, the uh and the um? Uh, uh, what can I do here to make sure that I am smooth and Uh, very comfortable in the way that I'm having this conversation such that I will engage the emotion. That is that I will create interest and not resistance from the person that I am calling. Uh, I would argue here that uh, to be a complete salesperson, you have to use the complete toolkit. So many salespeople have moved away from the phone because it's easier for them to write an email. Hey, it might be easier to write an email, but it is far less effective What do we want to do here? We want to look at it and say, not what's easy for me. We want to look at it and say, what is right for our customer? What is right for the customer? What is effective for the customer? So I just want to challenge you right now. This week, just lean into that. You can pick up Art's book. You can can ask yourself, what do I need to do differently right now? But lean into your discomfort. Embrace that telephone and see what happens. What's old is new again, and you can use that phone to make a world of difference. Oh, by the way, at the same time, you might find that you can change someone's world. We'll talk to you next time. 